Well, it's ASCO time, and I'm back with a video on Shine. Shine, the randomized control trial that shows you can shine a piece of, well, you can shine about anything. This is going to be part of my ASCO series. So there's going to be a number of papers coming out, I think, in the New England Journal of Medicine and other places. I'm going to try to cover the majority of the papers because I think those are the hardest hitting abstracts and also the ones where I get the most information to read. And today it's Shine. We're kicking off Saturday morning with Shine. Shine is a pretty, pretty bad randomized control trial. It's, it's so bad that I really wonder why it was published in the New England Journal. It's not practice changing. Um, it, it shouldn't have been selected. People should have pointed out these concerns. I'm going to run you through them. What is this randomized control trial? Well, we all know mantle cell lymphoma, a particular type of lymphoma that has sort of a range of presentations from a very indolent sort of leukemic form to a blastoid and very aggressive form. And there are a number of different treatments for mantle cell lymphoma. There is some agreement that bendamustine rituxin had a longer progression-free survival than our CHOP based on the Rummel study many years ago in indolent lymphomas, and that has been sort of a preferred go-to regimen. There are meta-analyses that suggest there may be a benefit from two years of additional maintenance rituxin. I think one of my colleagues, Talal Hilal, is the author of that study. And enters the new study. This is the SHINE study, where we take bendamustine rituxin and we randomize you to the addition of placebo or ibrutinib. Now, Many of us remember, and I remember because I was a fellow at the time, when ibrutinib entered the market for mantle cell lymphoma. The year was 2013. We had the previous ASH in 2012 seen the results of ibrutinib in the phase 2 study by Wang and colleagues. We saw that it had an impressive response rate. And in 2013, the publication appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine. I think in the summer of 2013, we're going to run through the timeline. And then by the fall, it was FDA approved. And most of us reached for ibrutinib as our de facto second line choice. We had already had Velcade and some other options, but ibrutinib had a really nice response rate. It had a very good salvage safety profile. So that's what we would reach for. So the standard of care, I think, by 2013 in the fall was pretty clear that you're going to give somebody bendamustine rituxin and then you're going to give them ibrutinib for many, many people with mantle cell lymphoma. This study wants to know whether or not you should combine all those drugs and they test ibrutinib plus bendamustine rituxin versus bendamustine rituxin. And lo and behold, the primary endpoint of this study is met. Progression-free survival. The time until your tumor gets arbitrarily bigger, you die, whichever comes first. The PFS composite time to event endpoint. That's improved. Three drugs versus two drugs, it's improved. The other difference, of course, is that the ibrutinib arm, they're allowed to take one of those drugs in perpetuity. They can take the ibrutinib forever, whereas the control arm is not allowed to take any drug in perpetuity. I think they actually prohibited even taking rituxin in perpetuity. You could only take two years of rituxin, and you could only take the placebo in perpetuity. So it's not only three versus two, it's three indefinite versus two fixed. And the primary endpoint is PFS. We'll talk about that. What are my points of this study? Number one, the fixed versus continuous. Uh, that's a bias, of course. Uh, the more you continue an agent, the more you can push out progression, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the best course. Three versus two, I think that's also a bias in favor of their arm. Let's run through the timeline. I'm going to put it up right here on the screen. I think this is key to understand. It's going to start December 2012. This is when the ASH presentation came out, the phase two study of ibrutinib. And it was presented to ibrutinib had dramatic responses in the salvage setting in mantle cell lymphoma. The authors of the SHINE study acknowledged that. I think it's reference 15 in their manuscript. Interestingly, they cite a 2015 paper as the first paper that established Rituxin in the phase one study. But that came out two years later. They don't cite this paper first. I wonder why. Maybe they don't want to draw attention to the date. December 12. December 2012, that's when we knew it had a response rate. May 2013, that's when Shine enrolls. It starts randomizing people to ibrutinib BR versus BR. Now, of course, you don't get all the people enrolled on the day one. It takes a while, and usually there's a little ramp-up phase to enrollment. By June 2013, they had already published in the New England Journal of Medicine website the results of the phase two salvage study of ibrutinib. So we knew ibrutinib had a dramatic response rate there, and many of us were imminently thinking about it, thinking about reaching for it. November 2013, the FDA came out and granted marketing authorization for that indication. It could have been used before because it was already available. It could have been given off-label. But now it has a marketing authorization, a supplemental marketing authorization for this indication in the salvage setting. Then the timeline goes red. 
Because from November 2013 to November 2014, they kept accruing on Shine, randomizing people to Ibrutinib BR versus BR. But this time, and anybody who enrolled earlier who hadn't yet progressed, which by the way is the majority of them because the median time to progression is like four years in this study, all of these people who are progressing after 2013, which got to be the vast majority of people, they needed to be getting Ibrutinib or a BTK inhibitor second line. And we're going to come back to that. That didn't happen. And this is the red zone. And then finally, they finished accrual in 2014, and they have their data cut off in 2021. And what do they find? They find PFS is better. OS is not better. OS is not better. And that's important. Toxicity is worse. Of course, you give more drugs, you can have more toxicity. And the question is, is it better to give ibrutinib BR versus BR than ibrutinib? BR and then ibrutinib was the standard of care since November 2013. No doubt about it. Everybody I knew, everybody I knew was doing that. The vast majority of these people who accrued between May and November 2013 hadn't progressed until November 2013. We have to acknowledge that. The median progression here is four years. So we're talking the lion's share of the people in this randomized control trial, when they progress, they should be getting ibrutinib. And what happens? I believe the answer is only 41 of them. 41 of them get ibrutin get any BTK inhibitor. And ibrutinib is an even smaller subset of that. It's like 30-some. And how many people actually progressed? So there's two denominators you could use here. This is an important point. Some people say the denominator you ought to use is the number of people who got any second-line therapy. But of course, this trial is accruing in places where second-line therapy is not guaranteed to everybody in the study. And you may be in a place where second-line therapy is not pushed as aggressively as in the United States. 106 people got second-line therapy, but 150 people progressed. And only 41 people got any BTK inhibitor. 34 got ibrutinib, 4 got ecolabrutinib, and 3 got xanabrutinib. That's between 20, 27% and 40%. That's very, very poor. This is poor post-protocol care. So... Let's go back to Shine. What are the key takeaway points? One, if you have three drugs, you give two and then you give the third, and you want to give all three up front, is progression-free survival a legitimate endpoint? The answer is no. You have to be dropped on your head to even think it would be a legitimate endpoint. Of course, if you take all the drugs in the to- all the drugs in the toolbox and give them all at once, you'll extend PFS. But what happens after that? You've exhausted a salvage drug, and what are the drugs you're going to have remaining? Uh, you're going to have more toxicity, of course. But we actually extend survival. So when they launched this study, I think they knew good and well that survival should have been the primary endpoint of the study. That's what people care about. They want to know by giving this drug early, do you actually extend survival? Now, the PI of this study, Michael Wang, um, oh, one more point before I come to that, the authors of the study. Now, you might say as well, you know, the right hand is not talking to the left hand. The Shine study authors don't know that ibrutinib has a dramatic response rate in the salvage setting. I'm going to put it up on the screen right now. I'm going to put it up on the screen. This is just a few of the authors who overlap. They have massive overlap of authors, okay? These are the same authors, the same first author. They, they knew. They knew the results of their own study when they designed this study. And they designed this study in a negligent manner because it didn't ask a useful clinical question. You give more drugs all at once, you're going to improve PFS. But what about PFS2? At least look at PFS2. What about PFS3? What about overall survival? Those are the key questions. Now, here's what the PI, Michael Wang, tweeted. Many colleagues raised the question on the SHINE trial that instead of concurrent use of IBR, might not be as good as using BR first and then subsequent ibrutinib. Please keep in mind that many patients do not make it to the second line in this aggressive disease. So what he's saying is that You know, we have to do it all up front. Many people don't make it to the second line of aggressive disease. And so if we did it in sequence, we might be missing many people who could get ibrutinib. But think about that. If it is the case that there's so much attrition between first and second line because people aren't making it to second line, then what would happen to overall survival? There'd be a dramatic difference in overall survival. It'd be easy to see if that were true. But it's not easy to see. There's no difference in overall survival, even when you had negligent post-protocol care in your control arm, which tells you that this is not a plausible explanation. Let's look at another comment. This is by uh, a doctor on the East Coast. Glad to see these data and how they will be applied or not in practice. Interesting to see some already opine and second guess that for a study designed more than a decade ago with a median seven-year follow-up that OS should have been the primary endpoint, mental cell lymphoma context and questions have thankfully improved over time. This person is saying that we couldn't have seen an OS benefit because the survival post-protocol is so good. 
So already there's a huge contradiction between these two people's statements, which is true, that so few people make it to second line that, that we, we can't withhold the ibrutinib, or that people are living so long anyway that we can't say to an OSN, benefit, OSN point. And the truth is both people are wrong, okay? Both people are wrong. Here's the question. The question is always, by taking all the drugs and giving it in this manner, do I maximize someone's quantity or quality of life? And if people are living a long time, that just means you have to have a much better drug to show a survival benefit on the back end of it. And you can't say that we didn't find a survival benefit because it's confounded by post-protocol therapy. What you're saying is my new costly, expensive, toxic drug, it don't work. It don't work at all. And think of the analogy of somebody running a race. We're running a marathon. And I'm running a marathon. I want to sell you a special drink. It's like Gatorade Plus. You drink my drink, and the first seven miles of the marathon, you're going to go a lot faster. But you're going to finish the marathon at the, next, at, at the same exact time you'd finish the marathon because the rest of it's going to be slower. And then what if I were to say, well, you know, my drink does work. It makes you run faster, but it's just confounded by all those subsequent miles. You'll say, shut the hell up. This is a race. You know what the distance is, and you don't run it any faster. Your drink don't work. I'm not running the race faster. End of story. That's what you would say. And you'd be right, of course. This is, this is sort of a huge cognitive deception in oncology. I mean, I think many, many experts, their the brains are not working here. The question is, if you are giving all these drugs, and if without those expensive drugs, you can achieve the same overall survival, well, then they just can't be that good, can they? And then the other point is, is that if so many people are succumbing to the illness in the frontline setting, so many that they can't get the good drugs on the second line, then it should surely be easy for you to show an OS benefit. But you can't have it both ways. You can't have your cake and eat it too, and yet you try. Yet you try. Now, let me talk about Shine broadly. Um, you know, this is bad. I mean, this is why... The whole process that would allow this study to be published, which is really a seeding or marketing study. It's a marketing study made by Janssen, written by Janssen. They talk about the medical writers by Janssen, for Janssen. It's to bamboozle the oncology community into prescribing their costly, expensive atrial fibrillation-causing drug up front early with everybody. That's the purpose of this study. Now, why? And I don't blame the tiger for being the tiger. That's Janssen. I blame all the other people who should have had the guts to stand up. Maybe the PI should have said, listen, you know, since I'm the first author of the salvage study showing dramatic response rates and we're pushing it to FDA approval, which we're likely to get because we've had discussions with the FDA, and it's very likely that in a few months this will be the de facto standard of care second-line choice, maybe we should build in our study IBR versus BR than I so that we can really see if the routine upfront use is better than the sequence. Maybe we should do that. Yeah, that's called having some courage and some... And some basic dignity that that's what it would take. That that's the right study to run. And you know what? If you had asked me in 2013, I would have told you easily that overall survival should be the primary point of the study. That's what people will care about in the future. Uh, that's not a surprise to anybody that 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 emerged. Okay, that's also very obvious. I also blame the New England Journal. The New England Journal. Why are they publishing this study? I don't know. Maybe it would be nice for them to disclose their reprint sales. What are reprints? One of the major sources of revenue at journals is that. Once these articles are published, the company will buy many of those little leaflets of these articles, and those can cost a lot of money. And by some reports, they can even go to the millions of dollars. Now, if a journal is addicted to that kind of money, they might look the other way when they think a company will buy a ton of these reprints, even if the science is really lackluster. In this case, it's clear. This is a useless study. It doesn't change your practice, doesn't change my practice, shouldn't change anyone's practice. As far as I know, BR, then ibrutinib, may even be better. Because here, BR and then delinquent therapy had the same OS. BR and ibrutinib might even have a better OS. I don't know. And it certainly has a better toxicity profile. And it certainly sort of is a more prudent or stewardship use of ibrutinib. It might even be better. I don't know that to be true. And they didn't do that study. They did this study. This study doesn't answer a useful question. I didn't have the question, should I give all the three drugs up front? Or give bendamustine rituxin, and then when people progress, uh, maybe about a third of them, I'm just not going to treat at all for whatever reason. And of the remaining 106 I treat, only about 40% I'll give a BTK inhibitor to. I didn't have that question because I don't practice in that negligent, delinquent manner. And I think, honestly, no doctor wants to practice in that manner. The only reason that's the case in this randomized control trial is that they're going to global sites where that is the de facto standard of care because they can't afford the ibrutinib. They can't afford it on the back end. And they certainly won't be able to afford it on the front end in the, if the results of the SHINE study are positive. So, the New England Journal screwed up. The reviewers screwed up. And the 
NCCN is bound to screw up because I'm sure they're going to incorporate this. Where does the rot come from? Where does the rot come from? The rot comes from the fact that, you know, the New England Journal has their conflict, which is the reprint. And what about the financial conflicts of the authors? I think that's going to be an important question. Let's see what they say. I didn't even look it up, but, oh, independent safety monitoring disclosure forms. Oh, they don't even put it anymore. They didn't put the anymore. No, they don't. They don't put all the conflicts right there and probably spill over to many, many pages, but we'll look into that. I mean, I think you have a field-wide problem where many, many people who are making these decisions as to what goes in coverage guidelines and how we're supposed to practice medicine are literally taking money from the makers of the product. And if you're in that situation, how can you ever have impartiality? And then the other thing is it's a race to the bottom because if this PI doesn't agree to this Un, 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 unhelpful and unethical design, then some other PI will, and they'll get a first author New England Journal of Medicine paper. And the last point I'll make is that when you criticize randomized control trials, let's talk about this. You know, uh, some of us have been pretty critical of this. Aaron Goodman, myself, some others. Um, uh, who has the right to be critical of this? Well, we're oncologists who have to see patients in real life and counsel them about these decisions. And this kind of shoddy and inappropriate science makes our life harder because now there'll be a buzz about IBR, but how will you explain to somebody that PFS, continuous versus fixed, three versus two, these are all biases, OS is still not lacking, post-protocol care. How will you explain all these things and unpack the real decision? And actually, this kind of study, it's not better than no study. I see some trialists say that it's better to get a bad study than no study. That's not true. This is so bad that it's worse than no study. I didn't need this study. I mean, I could have told you that you give all the drugs at once, your PFS is going to be better. I could have told you that up front. I didn't need this study. In fact, it makes the life harder for a doctor. It's actually more pollution, not information. And every doctor who takes care of patients has the right to criticize a study that is used to force and push and coerce us into changing our practice in an inappropriate way based on shoddy data. That's one. Two, the question comes, do you have to run randomized trials to criticize randomized trials? I don't know. It must be hard to run a randomized trial when somebody else writes it and sends it to your inbox and you have to say, uh, okay with me, no edits. I mean, I don't know. It must be pretty hard to do that. So anyway, that's obviously not the case. Many food critics, movie critics didn't actually make movie themselves. We all can appreciate and understand things that we utilize, even if we didn't manufacture, construct them. We can rate the iPhone without having actually worked in a factory making iPhones, et cetera, et cetera. It's a stupid argument made, I think, just to discredit the opponent and not acknowledge the fact that this is a bad study. They knew it was a bad study when they ran it. Anybody with an ounce of sense would have known the sequence is the real question. Three versus two, indefinite versus fixed. PFS is the primary endpoint. This is a self-fulfilling prophecy. You want to run studies like this? You're just abusing patients. You're using patients as the scarcest resource we have. You're abusing them for the market share of Janssen. You're shining something, but, you know, frankly, it's a piece of shit. That's what you're shining. So those are my thoughts on this video. You know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. I'll put this on the plenary session feed. I think I'll cover probably the majority of the ASCO papers. Um, this paper, no good. We'll talk about the other ones soon. Until next time.